we're officially starting. Thank you for um, attending this session in the Cloud Foundry in the government track. Uh, this is a panel discussion um, focused on uh, saving millions and delivering in minutes. Uh, and our esteemed panelists here, to help you kind of follow along who's talking, I went ahead and uh, put all the pictures that I could find on the internets. Um, and I couldn't find one for John, so I'm gonna let you apply some deductive logic to figure out which one is John. Actually, though, the, the first question that I have will be to each of them to just briefly introduce yourself and tell us a bit about your role and your involvement with Cloud Foundry at, at uh, the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency. We'll start with you, Eric. Yeah. Um, I start. Make sure you uh, Jack? No? So my name is Eric Levine. Um, I'm the team, team lead for the operations team that uh, supports NGA's deployment of Pivotal Cloud Foundry. Um, I started this process in August 2016, working as a member with some other people that had rotated off the project. Um, so we had Pivotal come in, and for eight months they helped us uh, prototype pretty a, a, a different type of environment that would fit the government. Um, <clears throat> we needed to be able to put uh, antivirus, a bunch of things that ops manager wouldn't do, so we went with a pivotal bits and an open source might like design uh, using Bosch straight and not using ops manager, um, which made a lot of challenges for us, but uh, we were able to overcome and actually I think in, in the end get a better, a better product out there. My name is Dmitry Didovicher, and I am Director of Development at Grancho Data. And my first experience with Pivotal was actually at the agency when a big agency program called Geon Services, which was meant to modernize the entire agency, brought us in. And they basically had one requirement, is to take our secure and compliant distribution of Postgres and natively integrate it with the Geon Services. Back then, I had no idea what Pivotal was or what the platform was. But within a year, we started working side by side with Pivotal folks. We, we started understanding Bosch, and we created the first native integration of a Postgres database into the platform. And that journey led to actually a partnership, and now our service is available in PivNet for other large enterprises. Hi, my name is John Lee, and I was going to say there's a reason why you can't find my picture, but uh, you know, just there's a last minute change that happened. There's a long story, but we'll go into that here. Um, I've been with NGA for about 15 years. Um, started as on the development side, uh, de delivered various capabilities, uh, image processing, uh, also did some visualization work, and that'll come up a little bit later, I think, when we ask some of the questions. Uh, but uh, most recently, I'm the uh, platform integrator for NGA. Uh, trying to help make the platform successful, uh, trying to understand customer requirements, the kinds of things that they're looking for from a development perspective, how we can make the platform better to suit their needs, and uh, excited to be here today. Hello, my name is Dan Zach. I also work on the platform operations team. Um, and my background is the Unix Systems Administration, and, and I've spent the bulk of my career doing enterprise management systems and tools, deploying them in government agencies, getting them in the credit, bringing them online and such. Um, and then I joined the, the, platform op, the platform engineering and ops team right like sort of in that second half of the push before we were like getting the systems live and going through the accreditation like that. And so um, <clears throat> after pretty much like most of my career seeing the struggles and the pains of deploying software into like these like government agencies and systems, it's been refreshing to see this, the work that we've done with Bosch and Cloud Foundry like start to make that process less painful and quicker. So. so as you can see, this, this is panel far more focused on the platform operation side compared to our last talk, which the app dev side. So um, Eric, you kind of touched on this a little bit. Uh, you guys have done a slightly different implementation of Cloud Foundry, leaving out the ops manager. You know, tell us about which pieces you're using. You know, how did you choose that approach? Uh, what are some of the other elements that uh, you know, have been important in, in how you've set up the platform specifically. So one of the, I mean, one of the big driving forces is we want to keep things consistent the same, and we have an environment that's disconnected. 
connected. And it's an AWS environment that's disconnected from the world on what we call the high side. Um, and <clears throat> sorry, AWS, that environment Ops Manager can't function on. So um, we wanted to keep everything the same. And then we had some security requirements that forced us to sort of not you know, use the constraints that Ops Manager gives and be more open. And then we found like going down that path, it took a, long, a little bit longer and we had to develop um, you know, lots of like our own sort of way of doing things with Spruce to take a Ops Manager derived manifest and transform it into what we can deploy in our environment, which requires certain, like, certain requirements that just are no, it's a no go without, but they're not, they just make things a little more complicated. Um, so that's why we sort of chose that. And then now we're able to have really consistent environments that are function the same way. And uh, we're starting to integrate CredHub and Concourse to automate those environments and make them really consistent and really cut down the, 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 the differences, which is what I think is really powerful about Cloud Foundry. Uh, I've been in the government for a long time doing infrastructure and getting multiple data centers, multiple networks, deployment exactly the same has been a challenge until today, basically, is what I would say. Okay, so, so maybe you can just expand on that a little bit more in terms of what does it mean to now have it be yeah. consistent? What does that translate so, to in terms of you know, we've operability? Dev environments or test and dev environments that people would write an app for, and then they're like, okay, we're ready, we're gonna go into production. They drop into production, and nothing's the same, nothing works right. Um, you'll have two data centers, you know, a failover data center and a primary data center, and you fail an app over and nothing would work right. Like I worked at uh, Army Knowledge Online uh, early on and that was a huge application being done in a smart, like a semi-smart way, but whenever they failed over, nothing worked. And if, they had, if that had been on a platform like Cloud Foundry, they would have been able to seamlessly fail back over and forth and everything would have been the same and consistent. So today, with Cloud Foundry, you're now able to yes, um, fail over and move from dev yeah. into production. Dimitri's uh, deployment is developed. We have a prototype environment that um, people can develop Bosch releases. Um, they have full rights to Bosch. They have our, our exact copy of what we run in production. They develop that. He hands over the release to me, and then I deploy it all over the place. And <clears throat> that kind of success works with the apps and the Bosch releases that we have. We have multiple um, Bosch releases that we use that we develop in-house or with partners. Um, so, how has Cloud Foundry changed the security practices at, at NGA? We heard a little bit earlier from the Air Force in terms of the controls. It'd be great to hear about what does it mean at NGA. Okay, on the, okay, on the platform side, I touched on this a little bit because in it, when, er, when Eric was talking, he was talking about how we made decisions. The whole time we were like laying out how we're going to deploy the platform, we were always thinking about security controls, right? Because that's if you were in the last talk, the actual process of getting things stood up and deployed is very, is very lengthy, right? And then there's, um, there's a set of security controls that feed into the risk process. And so, like, <clears throat> you basically have to say how all the, all the apps, like the, the methods in which they, you know, meet the various controls, and that's how you can gauge the risk of the overall system. So, <clears throat> with now, the way we're doing things now, um, we're, it's always focused on inheritance, right? So we de designed the, the platform in a manner that it's well documented and we've, we've, we sat with our risk teams and went through like how a Bosch deployed service will meet these controls, right? And, and we've demonstrated that every time you deploy it with this source controlled manifest, you get you know, the same outcome. And getting that like training and working through the buy-in like of those teams now when we go through the accreditation process, it's a known entity. It, we've documented which controls that the, if it's a service, the service receives from the Bosch deployment and the logging and everything associated with that. On the app side, there's a lot more because you're higher up the stack, right? So um, there's a lot more controls that they inherit. And by, I know that they talked about this in the, in the last presentation if you were here. You can see it dramatically reduces that time because before you'd have to bring, to bring a service online or a new, new system, you would have to go through all that te testing. And it would take, like sitting down and manually going through all this would, you know, it takes months plus. So 
now that the way we do things with Bosch and Cloud Foundry, those times are reducing every iteration, right? And we have these really lofty goals of getting almost on the app side, almost autom like automatic based on pipelines and tools. And on the, the services side, you know, it's days in some cases because you're, it's just a small subset of controls. And I know um, <clears throat> like crunchy data was one of the first services through. And I know Dimitri can speak to that a little bit more. Right, so obviously the end goal for any service at the place that we're working is complete, sec not just security, but a complete compliance, right? We can't just think of, hey, I just do this, this, and that. We also have to understand how all of this is mapped in the world of compliance. The, what platform enabled us to do is to scale that compliance, security and compliance practices to the entire enterprise. So what, what he was talking about is we were able to get our ATO, our authority to operate at the agency in about three days after we demonstrated a complete automation of all the controls. So we extensively, that was one of the reasons why Crunchy was brought in in the first place. We extensively worked with this to create a STIG specific for the Postgres distribution, but then we converted uh, that STIG into a set of automated test cases that were integrated with Bosch. So anytime, all throughout the agency, any user who creates an instance of a Postgres database, there's an automatically built-in compliance job running and constantly checking things for compliance. And if you, well, A, you can't misconfigure the database yourself, but God forbid there is an intrusion and the database gets misconfigured, we're gonna pick up that misconfiguration in a matter of minutes and notify appropriate personnel. And I would say the one thing that was critical to the success was actually taking the time and changing the, working to change the mindset of those risk people and test assessors to like actually make sure they understand this new way of doing it. It's a, new, it's a completely different mindset than the, what they were in. And then work through the automation and they eventually get on board because as Eric was talking about, you always heard that you know, like we use all these automation to deploy software and it's the same, but in practice it never was really close. <coughs> But now, like with these, we've demonstrated them on many occasions. It's easy to demonstrable to see, like, yes, it's exactly the same if you deploy it in this fashion. So then they get on board because now they can actually, like, you get reciprocity on, like, our disconnected environments because we can prove they're built the same way. And then your, your, your savings start to pile up because if you think about the, you know, just the scope of the, the, the foundations that we have deployed, I mean, every one we bring out now is much quicker. Uh, <coughs> Okay, so, you know, can you talk about some of the, you know, how apps were brought, um, apps or different services were kind of brought online for developers before Cloud Foundry, and, you know, then just sort of maybe walk us through an example of how that looks today uh, for, for a developer to access a, you know, a new service. So I can probably take a crack at that. So um, back when I was doing some development work, um, you know, the development process was was pretty good because we were doing that back in our factory, but then we'd always joke about how long it would take <coughs> to actually get it into production because then you gotta take it through the testing process, through the security process and whatnot, and sometimes that took months of time. Uh, and then other times when we were actually trying to get additional hardware provision on our operating servers, again, months at a time, you gotta put a ticket in, you gotta wait for people to do this and that, funding, chase it all around, blah, 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 that kind of thing. Now I can go onto the platform and I can spin things up in seconds, literally and uh, it's a much faster process. And in particular, also, when I'm trying to deploy things into production now, I don't have to go through these lengthy processes. Uh, the, the guys talked about this before, about how we've been working with security to reduce the timeline that it takes to get an accreditation, right? That's key. If you just bring a piece of technology into the agency, that by itself is not enough. You have to change your business processes to suit the technology as well, because what we found, we brought Cloud Foundry in, it allowed developers to go really fast, but our business process was still slow. So we're having to work to kind of help the business process catch up with how fast the tools let you go. And so we're seeing people being able to deploy uh, capabilities much faster now, sometimes down into you know, weeks, days, you know, much, much more rapidly than before, and which is really revolutionary at our agency. Um, what about maybe just also another example from a database service? Uh, Dimitri, you've been working, as you said, on bringing the first natively deployed Postgres to Cloud Foundry in the environment. You know, what would that have looked like for folks to, to, to provision a database before? So when, when I worked at other agencies or even private companies, 
it always starts with the ticket. You send the ticket to a DBA, then you wait a week for him to acknowledge that he received the ticket, then it would months and months go on and they provision something and then you get a bunch of emails saying, hey, here's your user and then another day I'll send you another email with the password. And uh, sometimes it took months and months and months. Right now you can go uh, in the agency, you can go to Geo and Services Marketplace and literally provision a secure compliant database in a matter of minutes. From, but but, but that's just part of the game, you know. People think, oh, we, we're running at DevOps speed and agile speed at the agency, but it means nothing if you can deploy your application or create your application in a matter of months and then wait six months for your ATO or security approval. Um, with us creating a common controls, now uh, your job is much more, as a developer is much, much easier because you pretty much don't have to do anything. You can claim the inheritance that database brings to the table almost immediately in, in your documentation. And interestingly enough, just before we started this talk, there is a person in the audience whose application is going through accreditation process at the agency, and he told me how great it is to be able to inherit all the controls from, from a Postgres database. And also on the app, on another thing that was in savings on the app side, we use like the single sign-on service. So there's another huge, like there's an onboarding process to deal with because there's an enterprise authentication requirements, right? So, and then they're associated, you know, security checks. So like now, it, by the, like in the same way they provision Crunchy, you know, they can bind with the single sign-on and like go, th like instantly have that function working versus like having you know, to spend all this time doing that. And like we, we were, when we were rolling out the system, we looked at the pain points of the developers and that was a huge one, right? Having to go, the, all these auth requirements. And then they get all those associated controls if they, you know, bind with that service. And then logging would be like another big one, big win for them. Because that was a tedious process for them as well. And there's a huge, like, bureaucracy to deal with, you know, the, your, what you log and the requirements for what you log and such. So we can, <clears throat> we offer that too, right? That's, that's pretty much just built into the way the platform does log aggregation, and as long as the developer's right to the, you know, the right places that... And the, I think, and to add there. to what you're saying, another big win was consistency of encryption algorithms. Because that, that's, the, the encrypting data at rest is one of the biggest selling points of standardizing this type of approach. And Bosch actually abstracted all the encryption at rest, and all we have to do is tie into those APIs, and now every database that you provision encrypting data the same way in the FIPS compliant matter all across the agency. Yeah, we, we spoiled the developer so much that I see comments like, uh, that I deployed crunching, it took 20 minutes. Is something wrong? <laughs> <laughs> to kind of follow through a little bit, I was talking to developer last week, and she said, uh, "We will fix that." <laughs> she said, "I can't imagine how uh, it would be like would be like without developing on the platform." She just can't, you know, imagine a situation like that. So her eyes would bleed. Right <laughs> <laughs> exactly. It's, I know it's like life before Snapchat. How did we get by? I don't know. Um, so, you know, John, you mentioned how the the business processes, you know, actually have been lagging what the platform has been able to deliver. Um, if from some of our, our kind of prior discussions, how has the collaboration and sharing between groups changed and what's been kind of driving that? And are there any practices or tactics that have made that possible that you, know, you could share with folks that might be applicable in their agencies? Sure, actually, uh, it's actually on his shirt right here. Uh, G1 <laughs> Services, <laughs> great uh, advertising, Dimitri. Um, G1 Services is an initiative at uh, NGA that uh, we're trying to kind of do things a little bit differently, try to embrace what's good about where we're at with technology now as opposed to the old practices. So we're trying to embrace open source. Uh, we're trying to embrace, you know, DevOps and Agile and all these kind of things. And not just in the sense of buzzwords, but I really like what the previous presenter said about a learning organization, right? You've got to continue to learn and you just can't, you, you can't say stagnant and say, well, I've got it figured out. I've got to continue to learn. Like Kubernetes is coming up, we've got to figure that out too. So things like that. But there's also a push there. So I, I, I'm assuming most of you are familiar with how the government works. There's a lot of different contracts, a lot of different 
um, fiefdoms and agendas, if you will. And we're really working hard in GM and services to try to work across that, try to make sort of a badge that's not your government, your contract, no, to get away from that. We try to really work collectively together as a team. You're on this contract, you're on that contract, doesn't matter. Let's all try to work together to achieve the same goal. So we're trying to make it a focus. I won't say we're perfect. We certainly have areas to learn and grow in, but we're trying to really work together. And we see a lot of good collaboration that's occurred to try to help us pull these things together. And again, you know, part of the whole doing things with a platform, that's new to a lot of folks, it's different. It, they have to kind of think about the world a little bit differently and say, hey, maybe I can really push off all this lower level stuff, this undifferentiated heavy lifting, and just focus on the business value that I bring at the top level of the stack. Let somebody else take care of the other stuff. And uh, so we're starting to see that being embraced and uh, uh, people come, coming along with us for the ride. Maybe you could tell us a little bit more about the, the geo, um, geo int geo geo services. services initiative. You know, is that something we're kind of creating an initiative like that is, you know, a, a, a way to kind of then have those conversations and, and prompt <coughs> change? It, it is a way, basically with geo and services, the way it's working is we're trying to show that it can be done differently, even in a large government agency like ours, that you can do, take a different approach and think a little bit outside the box. And so you kind of build a coalition of the willing initially, but they need to have some champions to help you take that message across the organization and really get more buy-in. And you know, you, you, have, you have to celebrate the wins and show that, yes, I can go fast. And sometimes you go so fast, people can't believe, like, how could you possibly go that fast and get things out the door that quickly? But uh, you really can. And so um, you, you know, just you've got to continue to work with folks. And sometimes they don't get it the first time. You've got to go back and talk to them again and just keep trying to get that message out. So in terms of building that initial coalition of the willing, as you described it, you know, how did that come together initially? Well, I think there were some key folks that kind of uh, had a vision. Uh, uh, ben Tuttle, who's not here, I think a lot of that was you know, his kind of brainchild. But there, there was a set of folks that initially wanted to really try to do things different. And they see how fast things can happen outside the government, embracing those technologies. They wanted to bring that in and try to make, really transform the government from the inside out. And so you just you have some visionaries that really wanted to change the way we do business and uh, make us, so we don't become relevant, we stay relevant, we're able to deliver value. And uh, they just kept focusing on that. And it's, it's been challenges along the way, and there's been some naysayers and people that like, they like the old status quo, but we can't, we can't afford to keep the status quo the way it is. We need to reinvent ourselves and get better. So that's what we're trying to do. I'd say also, just from a, like a technical perspective, on top of that, like, some of these automations and the way things work, and like I was saying, you can get around some of that like multi-contractor dependency bureaucracy by once like it's the systems are in place. It may have taken a little bit of time to get it there, but there's it's very hard. There's no like way to open a ticket. Right? Like the, all those manual processes that usually slow things down, now it's done just by prov automated provisioning, right? So it let like it helps kind of for force a little bit of that mindset change where people can't like try to slow things down and like make the you know nine different contracts to do one service you know like oh you could it just smooths that out in a like a less painful way and in a way that's harder to break once it's all in place i guess would be the biggest okay uh, i've got a few more questions i wanted to also just check to see if there were any questions from the audience i'm happy to kind of run out there Put a microphone up. Okay, one sec. I was just curious if you can talk through some of the pain points, um, again, as a vendor on these projects. Uh, I mean, it seems like a lot of the projects come with a architecture that's based on something from last century or last decade and try to adapt it to this platform model and then a lot of vendors try to build things 12 factor and you know from the get go and i just wonder what you know what you guys experience has been trying to adapt these older you know older type systems onto this platform model and what the you know i'm just curious what you have to say since i get in the room here we tend to do more of the operations and we just only hear about what they're doing but um, just getting the tools out to them and getting showing them how to that they can really reduce their amount of lines of code by using services like single sign-on and stuff like that, that and they start to see that they could deploy things fast, go through accreditation faster, and so that they have the, you know, the incentive to, to do some refactoring to, to make sure that it runs on the platform properly. And I can, I can add a little bit. 
these pains of learning the new ways of deploying and new ways of creating applications are not just applicable to the old you know, monolith applications. The folks who are doing even the modern microservices, still if they're new to Cloud Foundry, uh, there, there is some steep learning curve how to redesign your app to be able to run it on the platform. So like in my experience, there was this app, I mean it was written recently called Tagala, and my, my, they, they approached it and says, hey, we have this great code, but how do we actually deploy it to Cloud Foundry? So our directive was, uh, you, you're not here to work on tasks, you're here to empower other people. So I spent numerous weekends working with those guys to actually show them how manifestory <coughs> written, show them how to transform their code into something that you can do CF push, basically do things that normally DBAs don't do. You know that up? <laughs> <coughs> if, if I can add one thing as well, I mean, our agency is really wrestling with the fact that we've got a lot of legacy systems that were not built under 12-factor principles. And, you know, we had started down this path of trying to migrate to the cloud where we we're going to do a lift and shift approach. And that hasn't worked out so well for us. And so we're really trying to encourage folks to embrace doing things in a cloud-native way. But there could be a significant cost of refactoring, replatforming, doing all that kind of work to get it into that. So we're, we're still wrestling with that. Don't necessarily have a good answer. But, you know, in some cases, the, the simpler kinds of things, we're able to move those over. And we're teaching people how to make those changes. But sometimes we're just going to have, in some cases, we're just going to have to suck it up and do the work and, and, and get it moved over. Like the guy that was at T-Mobile is talking about some of the legacy applications that they've had to really work at to get onto the platform. We're just going to have to make that investment. And with the PKS coming on now, that gives us another opportunity. Maybe if we could go to a little bit lower level of abstraction, maybe that work is not so hard to make that change. How you doing? My name is Scott. I'm a recent Air Force retiree. Uh, who's been working in the cybersecurity side for, uh, you know, the last 15 years or so, dealing with policy directives, guidance, you know, from DOD level. Um, have you guys ran into any type of issues along the lines of policy, and how have you adapted to that, those requirements uh, in regards to making that change where things are written in black and white in the government, and we have to be able to be adaptive and, and agile? We've been, we've been through our conversations on what a privileged user is, and if there are privileged yeah. users on our system or not. And, you know, so there, it's just, we just keep fighting the education and just keep, you know, trying to get them to understand that, like, these developers can do stuff, but they can only do stuff in a really secure manner. And they can't really change things, right? The, the, the level of change that they can inflict upon their own application is very small. Um, and so <clears throat> that reduces a lot of the, sorry, that reduces a lot of the scope of the, of the work that has to be done for accreditation. And I mean, it, it's worth like the, the persistence. And also though, like as you see, they're pushing more like risk management more, right? So that lets you change the dialogue a little bit more from the black and white. Because really at the end of the day, what are you doing? You're trying to assess the actual risk, right? It's not about just, you know, meet the goals that have a secure system. And so as that dialogue is changing and they're, t they're the, the conversations you're having with the security people, it, it becomes easier to make this point because doing it this way is much more secure than what they have now, right? So I think that's helped and that's probably been, that's been valuable to some of our successes in getting the, that mindset changed in some of those entrenched, with some of those groups that have old entrenched views of how to do things, so. Okay, and I think this will be our last question unless it's a one word answer. <laughs> um, DevOps, when we, for production support, after you've implemented implemented everything, we were told, oh, the developers are gonna now be the ones that uh, monitor the system or take care of it if there's any problems with it, but we didn't have any developers to do that because once they finish the code, they move on to something else. So I was trying to understand how you adopted your production support approach after you actually implemented your, your, uh, your applications. So maybe just to, um, 
So we're using DevOps in the sense that we're using CI, CD pipelines to push. So you can't actually do a CF push into production. You actually have to use the Jenkins pipelines to push your code out. But as part of GeoN services, what's being stood up is an operations group that is going to basically take care of and maintain those capabilities once they're pushed to production. Obviously, they have to do that in partnership with the developers, but we're trying a new construct where we actually set up a separate operations team to kind of take care of the, uh, the maintenance of those uh, capabilities. Yeah, and with the platform, we've implemented tools um, like uh, the open source log search release and Prometheus um, to like sort of check the platform, make sure it's up and running, and then that app usually stays up and running. Just the nature of the way Cloud Foundry creates that. If it runs once, it'll keep running. And so there's a lot of reduced amount of, of that monitoring that needs to happen. Okay, thank you. I want to thank our panelists. I want to thank the folks in the audience who asked some questions. Great questions. Thank you.